Um, forgive me, I'm very jet lag. Um, I had 36 hours at home in between a trip from Iceland, so I'm trying to get through this. Um, I will tell you though that, um, like Jenny, I have difficulties um, speaking, so if you don't understand me, you know, just bear with me here. Um, and I'm just going to read from it because one of the issues we all deal with is brain fog and I don't trust my brain to remember it all. So in 1983, I graduated from Ohio Wesleyan University with a degree in journalism, got married, and within three years gave birth to our son and bought our first house. <laughs> Life was good, and I had no idea how quickly that all would change. My descent into what I call TMJ hell didn't begin with an accident or jaw pain or locking. No popping, no clicking, none of the things that would make you think my jaw was the source of the problem outside of teeth clenching. I was being treated for severe headaches and neck pain. <clears throat> After a few months of physical therapy, it was suggested I might have a TMJ disorder and needed to see a specialist. It was in the oral surgery department at a major medical center in Pennsylvania that I would meet the closest thing I have known to a snake oil salesman. He poked around my face and jaw for a little bit, had me open and close a few times, and then told me he needed a test before he could give me an accurate diagnosis. He thought the disc in my TMJ was dislocated and would likely need surgery to correct it using an artificial disc that he said would, quote, fix the problem with one simple surgery using a disc replacement made by Vitek. He assured me it was safe and approved by the FDA. Warning bells should have been ringing loudly at this point, like the ringing in my ears that never ends. But a, he was a surgeon at a top medical facility, complete with a level one trauma center, a rarity in rural towns, and a lot of high specialists came along with that designation, and I believed him. It turned out to be my biggest regret in life. I don't believe in do-overs, but if I could have a second chance at it, I never would have had that first surgery. That one mistake changed my life forever. Shortly after my first jaw surgery, I began experiencing excruciating pain in my right jaw, along with some pretty horrific popping and cracking. It was so bad that it made me nauseous, and my husband cringed when he heard it across the room. Rather than order another scan, my, the, um, oh, sorry, bear with me a second. Rather than order another scan, my surgeon had me get a splint from a local orthodontist and sent me for psychotherapy because, as he put it, I was an overstressed young mother and needed to learn to relax. Oh, sorry. This is the, yeah. Several years later, I learned that my right jawbone was literally eaten away by a giant cell foreign body reaction caused by the Vitek disc. The FDA eventually recalled the Vitek disc after discovering it destroyed surrounding bone in thousands of patients and in some cases even exposed brain tissue. And all my so-called top surgeon did was to send me for therapy to relax. That fateful first surgery was followed by several more. I'm currently at 12 total on my face and jaw. The most recent in 2015 required two separate surgeries. While my Vitek surgery was an elective procedure, the 11 that followed were not. And yet we still had to fight our insurance over my Lafort surgery because they considered it a cosmetic procedure. Why anyone would choose that surgery for cosmetic purposes is beyond me. And while the Vitek disaster put me on this never-ending journey of pain and surgeries, I don't want you to lose focus and think the Vitek disc was the only defective and or untested product in use. The two other devices I had implanted in my jaw, the Silastic disc and the Christensen TGR, were also pulled from the market. I had a failed muscle graft on the left as well, which makes me wonder why surgeries are still being done to create pseudo discs. To the best of my knowledge, fat grafts, along with temporal muscle flaps, are still being used to replace a damaged disc, and there is no science to prove that they work. And while total joint replacements were my only choice, they are far from perfect and only marginally approved by the FDA to give patients options. I worry about patients going, undergoing TMD treatments right now. 30 years after the Vitek disaster, we still do not have a standard of care. Oops, oh well, we'll give up on that part. Um, we still do not have a standard of care, whether we're talking about surgery with no consistent infection prevention protocols or less invasive but no less destructive procedures. Doctors who know the, know the chance for successful outcomes with a total joint replacement is higher the fewer the surgeries a patient has, and as a result, they are jumping right to total joint replacements and Lafort surgeries. 
patients need to stay away from surgery as long as possible and to look for other types of treatments such as physical therapy, craniosacral therapy, and massage, to name a few. It takes time and hard work to find a solution, and they aren't likely to be found on Facebook or Dr. Google, and they are often not covered by most insurance companies. Patients can't rely on FDA approval either. The same rule that allows the Vitec implant approval is still in place today. As a direct result of my TMD surgeries, I have had countless complications and procedures, including blood transfusions, a collapsed lung following a rib graft surgery, two spinal fluid leaks due to an implanted pain pump, and a suicidal depression that required five weeks inpatient treatment and five months outpatient in Arizona, while my children, then three and seven in Pennsylvania with their dad, wondering what they did to make mommy run away. Sorry, dry mouth goes along with this too. I have also had several traumatic intubations because anesthesiologists and non-jaw related surgeries didn't want to do a fiber optic intubation or a nasal intubation to protect my jaw. My last two TMD surgeries resulted in nerve damage to my eyes that eventually required cauterizing my tear ducts. Try to picture a red hot filament from a light bulb coming at your eye and you have to hold perfectly still while every other part of your body is screaming at you to run. I went into every surgery or procedure hoping my pain would improve, as did many of the doctors who treated me, but they never did. Most days my pain is unbearable and the current atmosphere surrounding chronic pain management and opioids has left patients like me terrified of losing access to our medications, often the only thing that makes some semblance of a normal life possible for us. While I have an exceptional family practice doctor who manages my pain medications along with my sanity, I never know when my pharmacy, insurance company, or the government might change the rules again, limiting the quantity or type of medicine I can take. Because I also take two different muscle relaxers, the pharmacist often insists on verifying it with my doctor before she will fill it, and sometimes making me wait another two to three days, and partial fills are not allowed by law. The stress of just getting my prescription filled has caused panic attacks so bad that my doctor now has me taking two anti-anxiety medications to ease my misery. I am terrified of what will happen to me if they outlaw my pain medica medicines, leaving me writhing in pain on the couch or in bed again like I did in the early days of my TMD treatment. I know several patients who have set aside meds that they might need for what they call an exit plan should their pain become unbearable. I know of two suicides within the TMD community in the last six months alone directly related to pain management. I was asked to share the cost of my TMD treatment with you. I'm sure it is easily over a million dollars, likely much more, but I couldn't tell you by how much. My most recent surgery was 90000 for the hospital in OR. I don't think it included the surgeon's fees or the cost of the bilateral joints. It might seem fairly simple to add up the bills to get a dollar figure, but how does one truly measure the cost? The actual cost of all the surgery, sedations, hospitalizations, or that which insurance rejected? The $2,000 a month we are paying for health insurance now because of all my surgeries that have now become pre-existing conditions as a direct result of the failed surgeries? And what of the cost of my career that never happened? Even at 50,000 a year, that's over a million dollars I didn't earn. How do we measure the pain it has caused our families? Or what about the cost to our self-esteem? Walking around with a washcloth to cover the drool that came out of my mouth uncontrollably after my Lafort surgery? Not wanting to join into a family photo because the nerve damage also took my smile? Not wanting to, or, or what of the embarrassment of having a cashier in Target look at me like that? Then at my husband and back at my bruised and battered face, less than two weeks post-op, looking like I had a stroke and knowing full well she thought my husband hit me. What about the loss of time? The all-consuming doctor's appointments requiring hours in the car, waiting at the pain clinic for at least four hours every month for 30-day supply of medication, only to have the pharmacist question how safe it is for you to take that level of medication. Nerve damage from my Lafort surgery left me with no feeling in my lower lip. As a result, I haven't felt my husband's kiss in over 30 years. Can you help me assign a dollar value to that? Or the pain look on his face when I cut a hug short before it ends with a kiss? How do we assign a cost that, to this that makes researchers take us seriously? 
And what of the anger at the doctors and manufacturers slash researchers who get to move on with their lives while well, we are left to not only pick up the pieces but the medical bills as well? And more importantly, how do we convince ourselves that even though we had a miserable day and our pain is out of control, and insurance has rejected yet another test or procedure, and that in spite of it all, it's still worth waking up again tomorrow? Or do I pray for a terminal illness that has an end date rather than this daily agony so at least my family won't hate me for giving up? I have lived in pain for over 30 years and that has been hard enough. Knowing that there is nothing left to do, no treatment, no surgery that will make the pain in my jaw or my knee from a knee, a knee replacement infection any better is a bitter truth to swallow. The only thing worse than living like this would be having to live like this without my husband and children by my side. Thank you very much, Tricia, for sharing that very powerful story.